Hi, this is Dr. L, and this is a short introduction to antibiotic resistance. I love this far side cartoon, this Gary Larson cartoon, because it shows two very anthropomorphized bacteria, one looking a little sinister and one not. And this one is handing a little molecule of DNA to the other one. And that little molecule of DNA is meant to encode an antibiotic resistance gene. And so this organism has that gene and it's offering to share that gene with this organism. And that depicts the process of what is called horizontal gene transfer, where one microbe can pass an unrelated neighboring microbe, a set of DNA, a sequence of DNA or genetic information. And um, that is something that's very important in natural communities of microbes and definitely something that can represent a way by which antibiotic resistance genes can move around in populations. And it's a fun cartoon. So to be resistant to an antibiotic means that a particular bacterium is able to survive and perhaps thrive or grow in the presence of that antibiotic instead of being harmed or killed, which is the goal usually clinically. And antibiotic resistance is a phenotype. It's a phenotype achieved because the particular bacterium has one or perhaps a set of proteins or, and therefore the genes that encode those proteins. And this cartoon is showing some of the common um, mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. So here we see what is called an efflux pump. Sometimes these are called multi-drug efflux pumps because they might work on more than one drug at a time. And here the little blue dots are supposed to be the antibiotic. This is the bacterial cell and that pump is pumping antibiotics back out of the cell as fast as they are coming into the cell. And in doing that, it keeps the concentration of antibiotic within the cell very low, and so the cell survives. It's a common mechanism of antibiotic resistance. That protein pump would have to be encoded for in the genome somewhere, suggested by this plasmid here. You could also have proteins um, that are antibiotic degrading enzymes, and so the antibiotic when it gets into the cell gets busted up and perhaps even consumed as a food source, and so therefore the cell does not die. And you can have what are called antibiotic altering enzymes where the antibiotic makes it into the cell and it doesn't get degraded, but it gets altered into a harmless form. So those are three different common mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. Many more exist than are shown here. There are many more resistance factors than just three or three categories. And also any particular organism can have one or a combination of these resistance proteins and the genes that encode them. So all antibiotic resistance is dependent on mechanisms that utilize proteins made by any particular bacterium. And those proteins are encoded by genes. So they're, therefore, in order for a bacterium to be an antibiotic resistant bacterium, they have to contain antibiotic resistance genes within their genomes. And this is not a new phenomena, so we talk about it a lot these days, and it is true that the numbers of infections caused by antibiotic resistant bacteria are growing globally, but the existence of antimicrobial, bac uh, antimicrobial or antibacterial resistant bacteria and those genes, this is not a new phenomena. We know from very old culture collections um, that predated the clinical use of antibiotics that this, is, this has always existed in nature, these particular genes. It's just that in the current environment where we have a lot of antibiotics in the environment for clinical and also agricultural use, we've got a climate where there's a selection pressure from all those antibiotics. And so the numbers of organisms out there that contain those genes are increasing through the process of natural selection. So it's not a new phenomena, but it is a growing phenomena. So the CDC, for example, estimates that there are more than 2.8 million infections um, per year in the US that um, are due to antibiotic resistant bacteria and about 35,000 people die from those as a result. The ones that don't die are obviously getting better, but please also remember that they would have had to have been um, 
treated much more aggressively and using antibiotics that are much more toxic and typically expensive, and there would be more hospitalizations in these people as a result of the complicating factor of an antibiotic-resistant pathogen. There are also, um, I'll point out, Clostridioides difficile, which is a, a somewhat naturally antibiotic-resistant bacterium. They're, they're all resistant to antibiotics is through their, their nature. It's like aspects of their cell biology. And so uh, many people every year die from C. diff infections, and there are many infections each year. And so we can consider that separately from these, this other category, but it's also a major concern. A case study on this, um, and this being concerns about antibiotic resistance, is tuberculosis. So TB cases, which are caused by the bacterium Mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, they, this is an ancient problem and there are still, you know, it's estimated that as much as about 20% of the world's population is infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. In some cases that infection is latent and not showing active TB and in other cases we have active TB, but many, many people on the planet are infected with this particular pathogen and increasingly we're seeing infections that are due to antibacterial resistant mycobacterium tuberculosis, in particular in certain countries that are shown here in this color-coded figure that we're seeing more and more antibiotic resistant infections um, in TB patients. And that is a major concern because if you, there's no effective antibiotic for TB, then the outcome is death. So this is a race with very deadly consequences um, because when we get an antibiotic and we use the antibiotic, then what happens is we see an increase in the number of pathogens that are resistant to it. And so pretty much as soon as you put an antibiotic into play, the more you use it, the less time you have available in which you are able to use it clinically. And so we're counting on the development of new antibiotics in order to stay ahead of the pathogen game here. And I'm not mentioning other strategies to treat bacterial infections, just to keep this simple, but of course vaccination would be another strategy not mentioned here. So we know this is an act of natural selection. It's, it's a force in nature that we really can't do much about. So if you have a mixed population of pathogens, let's say these are all one pathogen, you take antibiotics to treat those pathogens. Many might be susceptible because they lack those antibiotic resistance genes, but if a couple are resistant, they will survive the antibiotic dose, the antibiotic being the selection pressure here. And then because there's lots of room and space, they will multiply and they will grow, and that population will get larger. That gene frequency of resistance will get larger within this population, and then that human being can spread those particular pathogens to others. And then if they get sick and they take antibiotics, those antibiotics will not be effective, and this person will, will have a problem. So they will you know, possibly die or they will have to be treated with other antibiotics, usually the antibiotics of last resort, which are, as I said earlier, usually more expensive. They're also usually much more toxic, and so they have to be delivered, for example, through IV and in a hospital setting in some cases. And so this is really a pretty big and a very expensive problem with serious um, human consequences. And unfortunately, we don't have enough new antibiotics coming online. So the last time we had a truly new category of antibiotics, it was the lipopeptides, and that was back in the 1980s. And so since then, we've got what's considered to be a drug discovery void in this space, in this research space. So most of the antibiotics that we're using today where those classes of antibiotics and the class names are given here along with the years in which they were first brought into clinical use. Most of the antibiotics we rely on today are the ones that we have had for decades or perhaps very slight modifications of those previous ones. And there's some real reasons for this. So it's really challenging to get new antibiotics. For one thing, to get one new antibiotic to market is about a billion dollar investment. Um, and this is because it's pretty easy to find substances in nature that can kill microbes, but it's really hard to find substances in nature that kill the microbe but don't kill or harm the human. In other words, substances with good selective toxicity. That's actually a real challenge. Um,
Furthermore, in recent decades, some of the skills and the knowledge required to do that kind of research have dwindled. So there are few people around, fewer microbiologists around who are good at basic culture, for example, and are willing to do innovative approaches to culture, which can be slow and very frustrating. A lot of people don't want to do that kind of high-risk work. Um, they don't want to stake their career on it. So they're just, we don't have the workforce that we did back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s in order to do that work. Existing culture techniques may not be sufficient, so we may have tapped out the potential for finding new microbes using existing culture techniques, although I'm not sure that I believe that. Some people do. Clinical trials are super expensive, and there are very few funding sources to support the development of new antibiotics. And furthermore, and this might be kind of the real catch-22, once you get a new antibiotic, let's say you invested that $1 billion, the thing is, is the more you use it, the faster it will be used less because of resistance. So your goal in a way is not to use it too much. And that means you don't sell a lot, making it almost impossible to get that $1 billion investment back. So it's kind of a catch-22. And you can see why a lot of pharmaceutical companies, you know, they just, they, they really can't afford that kind of business model. So it's more lucrative for them to work in other research spaces. Um, and so we need to have better public funding for antibiotic discovery in order to stay ahead of this problem. And that concludes this short introduction.